second. Good morning, North Star. Welcome. We're glad you're here. My name is Brian Hubers. I'm an elder here, and I also serve in children's ministry, singing with the kids. Hey, our mission here at North Star is uh, we sum it up simply in three words. It's go, love, live. We go to the missing, we love the marginalized, and we live as God's kids. So thanks for being here. If you are new, we really appreciate you coming out this morning, and we would love to know that you're here. We have a couple ways that you can let us uh, know that you are here. Hopefully you got this white flyer on the way in. Uh, on the bottom of this page, you can see what we call the Connect card. It says Get Connected. If you wouldn't mind just jotting down your name and contact information, dropping it in the offering bag when it comes around, we'd really appreciate that. Um, you can also, oh, excuse me, you can also drop it off outside those wooden doors. We have a newcomer's table, and there's more information there if you'd like to learn more about this place. And the third option is via text. I think the number should be behind me on the screen. You can text your information there. We'll touch base with you, say thanks for coming out, see if there's anything we can do to answer any questions or help you get connected. Um, on that, oh, junior high. Sorry, I almost forgot about you guys. Fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth, if you haven't taken off yet. Um, I saw a whole bunch leaving as I was walking up. All right, junior high is rolling. So on that white flyer, on one side, I'll tell you a little bit more about this place. On the other side, a few things coming up, a couple things that I'll highlight this morning. The first is Jacob's Ladder. That is a program we put together for seniors in high school. They may not have the means to go to college, so we put this year-long program together. Um, if they go through that, fulfill that program, they can get $3,000 college scholarships. That's super cool. We're looking for two things. We're looking for students who would like to be a part of that, so if you know anybody, um, get them connected with us. And the other is we're looking for volunteers. So if that's a program that you would be interested in helping out with some seniors in high school, finding direction and focus in a future, um, please check out the white flyer for more information on that. Uh, the next item is a next level freedom. Uh, that's um, a ministry that we've had here for a while. It's a great program. It helps people get free from whether it's relationship challenges or addictions or financial freedom. Um, it's, a, it's a great, great um, group of folks that gets together. The next round is starting on July 5, so come on out, check it out. Um, it's a great, great um, group of folks. Again, White Flyer has more information, contact information, things like that. Uh, the last item we'll talk about this morning, we partner with an organization called Back to Back. Uh, we've been partnering with them for 10, 12, whatever, a lot of years, and uh, they are laser-focused on serving the orphan child around the globe, and we send teams out mostly during the summer to serve with them. We just had a group come back from Haiti, and uh, we are going to hear from Michelle French about that trip. So welcome to Michelle's Make Your Minute Matter. So they forgot to tell me that I only had a minute, so you're getting a little bonus today. It'll be like 300% of your money's worth. Um, so yeah, this is a picture of all of us. Uh, we took the kids to the beach, which was a really uh, a blast for them. Um, so we worked with a brand new orphanage to back to back. Um, this orphanage is called Rescue of God. There's 23 kids, ages four to about 16. Um, and physically, they had a lot of needs. They didn't have electricity, didn't have running water. Um, they had a very, very small space. They didn't have any shade in their yard. They didn't have windows, so no ventilation in their home. So it was very uh, easy to see the just blaring physical needs. Uh, we also found out that they typically only get one or two meals every day, um, so they were hungry as well. Um, so in the midst of all these physical needs, we tried to bring some things to ease those things. We built them some picnic tables. We did some painting around their home. We brought them sheets and pillowcases and pillows and let them decorate their pillowcases, and we thought it was so cool, and they thought it was so cool. Uh, we also brought them lights, um, and we did all this fundraising for the lights. And really, as an afterthought, we brought them Bibles. Uh, we got some Haitian Creole Bibles, and we gave them each their own that they could have. And, um, you know, they, uh, they were excited about the other gifts, but what they were most excited about was their Bibles. And uh, the very last picture I saw as we left is uh, they were all gathered around the tables that we, had that we had built, just pouring over their Bibles. And the older ones were helping the little ones with the hard work and they were just reading them, looking at the pictures, and um, it was a really special sight to see. Um, and it made me really think about, we, were, we saw these physical needs, but we didn't see their spiritual needs, um, and those are the needs that are much more important. Um, as, as I've come back to day-to-day uh, -day life, I've realized that the people around me, I don't see a lot of physical need, and I also don't see spiritual need, but the spiritual need is there in my friends and my coworkers. Um, and so that is really what has stuck with me, is that the spiritual need is so important, and God wants to 
step into people's lives and show them his love and share his gospel with them. So thank you all so much for giving. Um, as Brian is going to say in a minute, 25% of everything that North Star gets goes out to missions like this and helps children just like this. So thank you so much uh, on, behalf, on their behalf. Um, it's amazing to see the difference that that makes. So thank you very much. Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. All right, um, ushers, if you'll come down, this is our time of giving tithes and offerings. We see this as an extension of worship, uh, and as Michelle said, 25% of everything that comes in here at North Star goes to local and global missions. If you pray with me, that'd be great. King of all kings, you are worthy of our praise. You are awesome, God. Jesus, thank you that you came to bind the brokenhearted and set the captives free. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Brian. Great to see you guys on this fine June day. My name is Matt Massey. I'm one of the elders on the teaching pastors. If you're new here, it's great to have you here today. Well, let me open up with a question. The question is this. You ever feel like you're on shaky ground? You ever find yourself going, man, I feel like I'm on shaky ground. I don't know if you ever use that phrase. That's a phrase that we might hear, like you might say it of yourself, man, I feel like I'm on shaky ground. Or you might say it to your kids, you're on shaky ground right now. You know, you ever heard that phrase, you use that phrase? It means... We feel unstable, we feel ill-equipped, we feel uncertain, we don't feel secure. We hear things like, the stock market may have rebounded, but it's still on shaky ground. Or the economy is this house of cards that's still on shaky ground, right? Our world can feel really shaky right now. A lot of things going on in our world, whether it was a, the Paris attacks of a year ago, or however long ago it was, or Orlando attack where 50 people were killed. Uh, ISIS brings about shakiness in people's mind. The very idea of ISIS shakes people up. We got the Zika virus that freaks people out. We've got the election around the corner. We're all wondering who on earth are we going to vote for as we plug our nose. It's an amazing time <laughs> of feeling uncertain and unstable. You might feel uncertain and shaky in your job. You might feel uncertain and shaky in your marriage. You might feel uncertain and shaky in your relationship with your kids, in your family, in your dating relationships. You might feel uncertain just in, in your relationships in general, just going through life, thinking everything feels shaky. Uh, here's a, 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 a literal example that's kind of silly, but it's kind of the idea of what we feel emotionally all over the place. We are in the process of buying a third car for a driver, a student who is driving, which that's shaky in and of itself. And if you're like me, uh, you know, don't take my man card, but I know nothing about cars. I am like one of the biggest idiots in terms of cars. And so, you know, I, I know that you, where the gas is, I know where the clutch is. That's about it. And I, I can't change my oil. And so buying a new car, I feel on shaky ground. I feel, I, I walk in and, and you know, and I, I have like $2 to spend and like, you know, and, and I'm online going, oh my gosh, I don't know, does it have an engine, does it drive? And I just kind of, I feel really, I feel very helpless on a shaky ground. Anyone relate to that kind of feeling? Yeah, spiritually, I think we feel that way. Like, like I, I feel like every time I walk into a car place, just take my man card, and you guy be like, you need a new engine. I'll be like, okay, you know, whatever. I, I feel on shaky ground. Here's another example of a silly one. My, my wife and kids gave me a, a pedicure for Father's Day. Because uh, they, they said my toes are horrible. And I go into the, to Venetian to get a pedicure. Talk about feeling uncertain and shaky ground. I have no clue what I'm doing. The lady saw my going, uh, uh, yes. And I just kind of, I feel stupid. I, feel, I don't know where to put my feet. Don't know to, what do I do? Do I lay back and sleep? Do I watch? Do I, it's, and she would ask me a question. I'd be like, I don't, yes. And then she'd hand me something. I, didn't, I don't know what you asked me. I, don't, I have no idea. I felt totally uncertain. I just know that my toes look better, according to my family. Okay, so here's the deal. Spiritually, emotionally, we feel like that, many of us feel like that all over the place. We feel like that all over the place. And, and here's the deal. If you feel emotionally and spiritually on shaky ground, you will feel on shaky ground in your physical life. So many of us try to do it the other way, way around. We try to fix our physical life and hope that the emotions will follow. If you fix your emotional and spiritual life and get that on non-shaky ground, then the rest of your life will feel less shaky. I, all of us have experienced times where you're doing great emotionally. You've got your eyes fixed on Jesus. You're spiritually sound. And work is going along. It may be hard. 
Relationships could be hard, but you kind of clip through. And then the next week, you take your eyes off Jesus. You're not emotionally sound. You're not spiritually sound. The same job, same relationships, all of a sudden feel haywire. Can we relate? Truth. Jesus is our solid ground. Jesus puts us on solid ground. Jesus gives us solid ground. He is our solid ground. And as Christ followers, we are supposed to be the most secure, most stable, least shaky people in the universe. Christians are be known by a couple key characteristics. Love, humility, generosity, fearlessness. Unfortunately, that is not what's often said about Christians. Unfortunately, the stereotypes or the attitudes spoken of Christians are angry, irritated, legalistic. That is not what a Christ follower is supposed to be known as. We are supposed to be known as those that are unrattled. We are secure and say, well, that does not mean we're problem free. It doesn't mean everything goes well for us, but it means in the face of crisis, we stand with confidence, we stand with security, because we know our, who our God is, and we know who our God has made us to be, and therefore, we know we stand on solid ground. That's what we're going to talk about today. So why don't many of us feel solid? Why do so many of us look like we're on shaky ground? Why do so many of us feel shaky at work? Feel sh- why? we got to wrestle with this. What areas of your life do you just feel like, I'm out of control here. I feel in chaos here. And I would put to you, as we're going to look today, that's because we need to believe the Jesus that we follow more. It's not about believing. Most people here on a Sunday morning say you believe in God, you're here because you believe in God. But we need to really believe and put our faith in him to a degree that we say, I fix my eyes on him, the author and perfecter of my faith, and therefore I know and live like I'm standing on shaky ground no matter what kind of chaos is going on around me. Let's pray. Would you bow your heads? Jesus, we want to be a people that believe the truth of who you are and walk in that truth and be a people that walk on solid ground. In your precious name, amen. So if you've not been with us, we have been looking at a book called Hebrews, and the series has been called Let Us. And the entire point of this book was written by, we're not sure, maybe Aquila, maybe Paul, Barnabas, we're not sure, but the entire point of the book was written to Hebrew Christians those Christians, those Hebrews, Jewish people that had given their faith, given their lives to Christ in faith. And they were getting hammered on both sides. The Romans were crushing them for being Christians, and the Jews were crushing them for being now Christians. They were getting persecuted left and right, thrown to the lions. And the author is saying, stay the course, don't quit. They're asking two big questions. Is Jesus worth it, and does Jesus work? And they were like, I don't know, I don't know. And the author keeps saying, yes, Jesus is worth it. Jesus does work. Whatever you think was great, Jesus is more. You think angels are great, Jesus is more. You think Moses is great, Jesus is more. Stay the course in Christ. He's everything. He is worth it, and he does work. And then they give us these 16 letter statements, and this is our last week of this series. By the way, a little commercial. Next week, we kick off a four-week series called Persecuted. We're talking about the persecuted church all over the world, in China, and different places. Tons of countries are people experiencing persecution. We'll look at that. <clears throat> Pretty cool series. Anyway, 16 let us statements that are high invitation, high challenge statements that invite us to experience Jesus more and walk more powerfully. And when we come to the last one in Hebrews chapter 12, <clears throat> verse 28, let me read it and we'll talk context. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So before I delve into the verse, let's remind of context. Again, whole book, big idea, driving home, Jesus is everything. You think angels are great? Jesus is more. Moses is great? Jesus is more. Joshua is great? Jesus is more. All these are the great people of the Jewish faith. We come to chapter 12, We've just looked at chapter 11, what they call the faith hall of fame. Person after person after person, by faith, by faith, by faith, they trusted God and did amazing things. And then the author says to us, chapter 12, therefore, fix your eyes on Jesus. Since we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, these people, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. The author is saying, look, Jesus for life and hope are found. Lock your eyes on him and life will go better, Right? If we want to experience that he's worth it and that he works, we've got to fix our eyes on him. 
David talked last week that when you, when you run, if you look to the left or the right, you're going to get off course. We've got to lock our eyes on Jesus, who's the author and perfecter of all life, and then things go better. It, it's simple. It's not easy. But it's simple. It's kind of like in marriage. If you're married, you know that if you take your eyes off your spouse and start putting it in other places and stop spending time with your spouse, then your marriage will start to wane. It won't happen overnight. But slowly but surely, like the frog in the kettle, it'll warm and eventually your marriage will die because you've not locked your eyes on spending time with her or spending time with him and loving that person the way you're called to love them. Same way, if we take our eyes off Jesus and look elsewhere, job, people, friends, we look to life elsewhere, eventually that relationship will wane and we won't experience the power that that relationship promises. The author tells us, and I believe it's true, that when we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, verse 3 says, we won't grow weary and we won't lose heart. Our hearts will be strong. But then he goes on to say, or she goes on to say, in the midst of following him and fixing our hearts on him, we're going to have hard times. We're going to go through really hard stuff. This world is broken. Who here agrees that life is hard? I mean, only in America do we kind of waver on that question. The rest of the world goes, yeah, duh. We're, only in America we kind of surprised by the reality that life is hard. Life is hard. It's going to be hard. The only way to do it well is to fix our eyes on Jesus. And he says these hard times are either allowed or caused by God for our discipline. Those that are in Christ, those that are children of God, those hard times are allowed or even caused by God because he loves us so much that he disciplines us. Now this word discipline confuses us because we've used the word discipline as like beatings. I'm going to discipline you. But the word discipline is a beautiful word of training. It's a beautiful word of loving someone so much you're going to strengthen them and grow them. There's a big difference between discipline and punishment. Discipline is what a good, loving mother or father does to help their child grow. Discipline is what a good coach or personal trainer does to his or her players in order to help them grow and be strengthened. Discipline is good. Punishment is when you've been evil and you're broken away. And the beauty of God is he even uses punishment. Say a murderer is punished, put in prison. But God even uses that kind of punishment to try to turn that person's heart if they will let it. Discipline is what God's kids get. And discipline is part of the story. The passage says a loving father is what it, it disciplines his children. If you're not disciplined, if you don't experience hardship and stretching, then you're actually not one of his children. Verse 7 says this, it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For those human fathers discipline us for a short time, as it seemed best to them, but our heavenly Father disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. So the context is we're getting to this verse Fix your eyes on him so you won't grow weary or faint-hearted. He's going to discipline you. He's going to let you go through discipline for your benefit to challenge you, to grow you, to shape you. We have a good, good father who disciplines because he loves us and wants the best for us. And therefore, verse 12 says, therefore, in light of that, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak, or the Greek is literally shaky knees, and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may be not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. The author's saying, look, I know you're tired. They're going through lots of persecution. And I can look at you right now and go, I know many of us are wiped out. You're tired. I know you feel like you're on shaky legs. But the author's saying, look up. Look up. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Raise your drooping hands. Strengthen your shaky, weak legs. Know who your God is. Lift up your hands. I like the picture of worship is lifting your hands and saying, I've got nothing. You're everything. I surrender. Stand up on those shaky legs. And when you do that, you'll get stronger because God infused you with strength. And secondly, I love the second part of this. When you make straight path towards Jesus, the verse says, it will cause those who are lame around you to be strong as well. When we stand up in Christ and we lift our drooping hands, lift our eyes towards Jesus, and we stand on those shaky legs and go, you are God, I am not. Everyone around you is going to go, well, I want to drink what they're drinking. 
I want to eat what they're eating. I want to know who they know. Can you guys all relate to knowing someone like that? I, I've got a personal example of somebody, and I, she wasn't here the first service. She's here the second, and I didn't ask permission, so I owe you a dollar. You know, every time I tell a story of my kids, I'm supposed to give them a dollar. But I, you collect. But Jen Anderson has been a longtime friend of mine, and she has been walking through cancer for a long time. She's not healed yet. We're still waiting for healing. She continues to get the crud kicked out of her in this whole deal. But I'm telling you, this woman is a hero of mine. She's a hero. And not because she's perfect. Not because she and Brad are perfect. You know, they, they, are, they are beat up. They're beat down. She's got a blog called Do Today Well. And it's a choice she makes every day to say, I'm lifting my drooping hands. And I'm standing up on shaky knees to trust my God and do today well because my God is God. It's not perfect. But I'm telling you, by watching Jen, I run stronger. I don't know how it's going to play out. I know for sure, no matter what, she's going to be in paradise with Jesus someday. I'm hoping she stays around a lot longer with her family. As she's going in this journey, she's making me stronger. You make me stronger. Thank you. That's what the body of Christ is supposed to be. And then the author tells us something really shocking in the midst of that as we're getting to our verse. The author says the reason we can lift our drooping hands, the reason our shaky legs can be strengthened is this. He says, look, we are not like the Israelites who could not touch the mountain of God or could not come close to God. Now, what does that have to do with, what, what on earth? It's almost like the, the author's doing a, 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 a big knee-jerk reaction or a big, big pivot, but they're not at all. They're making a point to remind us of what the Israelites, the Jews, went through in the Old Testament. The Jews of the Old Testament didn't have Jesus. They didn't see Jesus. They are waiting for the coming Messiah. They didn't have the Spirit in them. When they came to God... God delivered them out of Egypt. They were slaves, pulled them out of Egypt and brought them to Mount Sinai to give them the law. And the law was to show them they could not do it on their own. And God was introducing himself to them, letting them know, I am the almighty, holy God to be feared. You got to start by fearing me rightly. And he brings them to the mountain. God says, Mount Sinai says, if anyone touches the mountain, if a plant touches it, if an animal touches it, anyone touches it, you're going to die. Exodus chapter 19 they're all gathered, and here's what it says. This is, this is our God. And again, we're in the New Testament culture that got to see Jesus. This is, God hasn't changed. He's still this God. It's pretty terrifying. On the morning of the third day, thunder roared and lightning flashed, and a dense cloud came down on the mountain. There was a long, loud blast from a ram's horn, and all the people trembled. Moses led them out from the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain, all of Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord had descended on it from the, in the form of fire. The smoke billowed into the sky like smoke from a brick kiln, and the whole mountain shook violently. This is not a little kumbaya moment. They are standing at the foot of the mountain going, Oh, God. Their first big meeting with God. They just seen God do amazing miracles in Egypt. And now God is saying, I am your father. I am your God. Do not take me lightly. It was a feeling of fear and awe. And God was trying to drive home the point, I'm a holy God to be revered, held in awe. Do not take me lightly. And they trembled and they were so afraid. Chapter 20 says, they looked at Moses and said, we don't want to go up there. We don't want to commune with him. You do it on our behalf. It's too much. And even Moses, the great Moses, trembled and said, God, it's too much. God was driving home at a point. But now we get to where we are today. The author says, we're not like those. We are of a new covenant. We are of a new race. We don't have to approach God like that anymore. He's still that holy God to be feared but we are the covenant of the Spirit in us when you said yes to him. And we get a relationship that is so different. We get to approach him with intimacy and nearness. It's like a child approaching their father who's also the king. Everyone else is bowed down. And the child walks up and says, you're the king. You're also my father. Here's what the verse says. But you have come to Mount Zion. 
and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the innumerable angels and feastal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn, that's us, who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. This passage is loaded theologically. I challenge you to go home and read it and meditate on it. There's two mountains in the Bible. One, Mount Sinai, where all that happened. Then Mount Zion is this beautiful place that is referenced multiple places in Scripture, mostly the future spiritual kingdom that awaits us in Revelation. We are of Mount Zion. We can approach Mount Zion without trembling in fear. We can touch Mount Zion. Mount Zion is touchable. And as we approach Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, we're surrounded by innumerable angels, warriors, who are gathering in worship with us. And we as the firstborn, anyone who's in Christ, the firstborn, the spirit in us, we're enrolled in heaven. We get to approach our God, who's the judge over all things. And yet Jesus stands in our place as a mediator saying, that person's sinful. Everyone here is sinful, but they said yes to me, so now they look righteous. I've made them holy in my name, by my blood, by my power. And my blood is far better than the blood of Abel. That blood of Abel back in the Old Testament is nothing. It's empty. My blood is perfect. And guess what? He's risen. Oh. <laughs> this is an intimate, powerful relationship. And this mountain does not quake and it does not shake. We are now a part of a kingdom that cannot be shaken, is not shaken. When, when, when Orlando hits, God is not shaking in his boots. When Paris happens, God is not shaking in his boots. God is not afraid of ISIS. God is not afraid of Zika. God is not afraid of the election. He does not care who sits on the American throne because he's God. Because of what Jesus done, has done, when we trust him and receive him as our Lord and Savior, we now stand on ground that is secure. We fear him as our God, but we do not have to be afraid of him. We are secure to live in his power because of who he is, what he's done, and who he's made us to be. We have a kingdom that's unshakable. Now we come to the verse. That's the therefore. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Here's my challenge to us. Do we believe this? I want the people of God to smell different than what the media says we are. I'm tired of hearing, I'm just going to say it, jerks like the guy in Sacramento that called homosexuals rotten, dirty things after Orlando. I'm tired of him getting the press. I want, I want the world to be in awe. I, I want this community, Kings, Mason, Loveland, Milford, Sycamore, Madeira, I want these communities around this church to say, those people have something I want. Those people smell of love. Those people smell of grace. Those people smell of kindness and goodness. Those people smell of power. They're not rattled. They're not afraid. When, when the stuff is hitting the fan, they stand resolute and go, I'm okay. I'm not perfect. And the scripture gives us two ways to experience and express God is our good, good father who is unshakable. And it's through thankfulness and worship. This has to be the regular part of our diets where we're regularly thankful, regularly saying, oh God, let me remember who you are. Let me remember what you've done. I thank you for this. I thank you for that. And it's, we're not like, we're not like uh, thanking for a Christmas list. We're thanking for the real stuff. Thank you for your life and death on the cross. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for redeeming me from my brokenness. And when we, we're thankful and we worship, we recalibrate our hearts and our minds. We regain perspective we get away from looking away and going, oh, it's kind of like Peter, right? When he was walking on water, he saw Jesus walk on the water. He got out of the boat and walked on the water. He saw Jesus. What happened when he took his eyes off Jesus? It says he saw the wind and waves. <gasps> I 
That's what happens. We take our eyes off Jesus. We see the wind. As opposed to seeing Jesus, where we gain strength and power. My friend Paul Smiley and I were talking about this. He was preparing for his son's uh, graduation party. He had lots to do, and he got strep throat. He was knocked down. He's laying in bed, and he's getting irritated, going, I feel sicker than a dog, and I'm just irritated and feeling the stress and anxiety of all he had to do. And the Lord just spoke to him in that moment. And again, if you've been with us any time at all, you know we say the Lord speaks to us. It's not an audible voice. Some people get that. I've never gotten that. Neither does Paul. Paul's laying there. Just a thought rushes into his mind. Why aren't you thankful? Why aren't you worshiping me? Just worship me. Be thankful. And he spent the rest of the day laying in bed just thanking, praising God, worshiping God. And he said, I woke up the next morning. I was perfectly better. He is not saying, nor am I saying, that healed him physically. Could. God's not beyond that. God can do anything. But the idea is in that day while he was still sick, his heart changed. His heart stopped racing. He began to relax and said, you're God. You're on the throne. You've got this. It's going to be okay. Most of the stuff we worry about is really not stuff to worry about, is it? We've got to lead the way in fearlessness. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say something that's going to touch some nerves. Ready? It's going to touch some nerves. I, I, like, I like to do that. You know that, don't you? <laughs> so before I say, I'm okay with guns. I own a gun. I'm okay with guns. Got that? I'm a little tired of Christians. We have to have guns. We need to have Christians pounding the drum of having to have guns. We better have guns. And I look at them like, why? Why do you have to have a gun? To protect ourselves in the suburbs. <laughs> 49 years. I'm going to be 50 in two weeks. In 49 years, I've never had a neighbor get robbed. I've never, I've never needed a gun. I've never been in a place where I needed a gun. Ever. Really? We've got to protect ourselves. Come on. This is this thing like Christians, we've got to lead the way. Like, yeah, you know, whatever. I just have for fun, but I don't have to have a gun. If, if, all, if all hell broke loose in the world, where are we going to take up? Ah, I'm going to kill you all. No. <laughs> Come, eat my food. I want to show you the love of Jesus. Come to my house. Take what you want. I see an unshakable ground. You can't kill me. I'm already dead. I belong to Jesus. I'm going home. Do your best. Come on. I'm sorry. If you, I'm not challenging owning guns. Guns are great. Don't email me, please. You get my point. We need to breathe in the power and grace of God so we stand on a shakeful kingdom. I want to invite the band up. We're going to spend, we finish in way early today. We usually go to 12.15. Today we're going to do 30 minutes of worship. We're going to do 30 minutes of thankfulness. Before we rush to take communion, we're going to worship for a couple songs, and I'll invite you up for communion. I want you to stay for all of it. You have 30 minutes to carve out, to fix your eyes on Jesus, to give space to breathe, give space to be thankful, give space to have acceptable worship. What is acceptable worship to God? Acceptable worship to God is not that you sing really well, it's not that you dance really well, it's not that you lift your hands. Acceptable worship to God is your heart saying, I am not God, you are God. I come before you empty-handed. I'm going to invite you guys to do, take some risks. Men, this is going to be challenging for you. We men don't do this as well, but I'm going to invite you to lift your hands in holy praise. When I lift my hands in worship, I don't do so because I feel something. I'm not a great feeler. I lift my hands for two reasons. Number one, Scripture says to do it. I'm a pretty literal dude. Scripture says do something, do it. Lift your hands in holy praise. But I also do it because it's my way of physical outward posture of saying, God, I surrender. I surrender. It's also an outward posture like of a, da of a child looking at his daddy saying, pick me up. Daddy. Daddy. In doing that, something in my heart changes. In doing that, my heart is recalibrated. You don't have to raise your hands. But I'm going to invite you to take the risk. Some of you may want to kneel to get down on your knees and say, God, I am not God. You're God. Remember we talked about at the beginning of the year, the Kairos moment about worship. I don't know if you were here, but I talked about it. God challenged me to worship more, to be a worshiper, a spirit and a truth. I want my last third of my life. I don't know how many days I've got left. I want to be known as a worshiper. 
when I hit 50 in the next 30 years, 40 years, I want to be known as that man surrendered his life to Jesus. He was bought with a price. He knew he was bought with a price, and he gave his life to God. He didn't care what a thought. He wasn't looking to the left or the right to see what someone thought. Take my man card if you want, I dare you. Let's stand as men with hands raised. Let's lead our families as men with hands raised, saying, you are God, I'm not God. Let's model for our wives and our children. I surrender. Moms do the same. Single people do the same. Students do the same. I do not belong to myself. And we stand on shaking ground. Would you stand with me? You may want to lift your hands. You may want to. I'm going to read you a Psalm 46. And we're going to worship. This is how they'd open worship. God is our refuge and our strength. He is a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, even though the nations rage and the kingdoms totter, our God utters his voice and the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots of fire. Be still and know that he is God. Be still and know that he is God. He will be exalted to the ends of the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Let's worship.